Hey movers, it's Sally Z with Be Moved. Let's go create some talks that will move this world. We're going to talk with amazing speakers, share tips, tricks, resources, and we are going to be moved so that our audience can be moved. This moved me. What is moving you? I can hear how you're doing. Oh how my you're gosh. In. Well, my you know, my wife is working today. She had to go into court. Mm. So I have my kids watching Star Wars in front of me. So hopefully my mic will not pick up episode one, The Phantom Menace. So you know, even if it does. It's like, this is the world that we are living in right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's real. It's, it's unreal. Surreal, unreal, bizarre. These are all the words I've been using. So wild. Um, yeah. How's the transition been for you into doing your services online? Well, so we've been, we've been live streaming for six years. Okay. So, um, and typically we have about... We've been running about 200 people watching us online a week, maybe two, maybe 225. Wow. And then, and, and now we've gone from that to like everybody online. And so that's been like a thousand or 1100 people watching online. Wow. That's awesome. So we've had, yeah. we've had some, tech, some tech glitches the first week, you know, our hosting company wasn't prepared to, you know, five X, you know, our, our traffic. Right. Um, but, uh, but we kind of made it through. Um, and we have a great team that's kind of figuring out a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. And, um, and yeah, I'm getting used to speaking to an empty room. So that's. Yes. Well, that, that's kind of where I want to start. Okay. Because I'm getting a lot of um, just people reaching out to me and saying, how do I do this? via video. I mean, literally taking a conference keynote or in your world, a sermon and mm-hmm. you're, um, you know, whatever you're, you're having to pretend like there's an audience full of people there. Are you trying to tell me about what that's like for you? And then I have some follow-up questions. So, um, so it, it feels like speaking to an arena. Have you mm-hmm. ever spoken like in a really, really huge venue, like an arena? Um, um, yeah, I mean, there was like 6,000 people. Yeah, That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. So it feels like that where you have a massive stage, you have a huge dark room and you're trying to, um, overextend yourself and your energy so that you connect with people. And so mm-hmm. I, I felt way more exhausted than normal mm-hmm. after last Monday. And oh, I think it's because I was trying so hard to project, um, to, uh, help my body language and everything go through the camera. And I think I was, I was even more engaged than normal. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit of what it feels like. Um, you know, we, we had some people in the room the first week we were just streaming two Sundays ago, but once we hit the 10, no more than 10, like the room was basically empty. Yeah. Um, and, and they turned off my microphone because it helped with the acoustics for people online. So like I wasn't hearing myself in the PA anymore. I just was yeah. hearing myself talking normally. So that was an adjustment too. Yeah. Um, but I've gotten some great feedback. People saying, hey, you're not any different online than you are in person. Okay. And so that's been really, really encouraging. So I think it's just going, okay, speaking to the camera um, and instead of the room and thinking still like in the process of development, like who are my... Um, who are my types I'm speaking to, you know, whether it's, a, yeah. um, uh, what's the term, um, an avatar or like an actual person. I can imagine okay, this message is for this person who's dealing with this and this and this, and I'm trying to help them go from here mm. to here. And so I think all those kind of things are really important because those people are now having to be in your imagination. Totally. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. That was a big thing I've been talking with people about is it's an imaginative exercise the connection that you are making is is even more important than before but 
it's really such a powerful exercise for our imagination because we have to be so clear in our minds who we are talking to. So when you're looking in that camera, you can imagine them, see them, you know, as much as possible. So it's interesting that you, you're you thinking about different people as you go along or these like different avatars, different, um, you know, caricatures of people. Uh, because without that, I think it can feel, we sort of, it's like unanchored, you know, mm -hmm. floats out there instead of searing into the audience so they can feel it, you know? And I, and I have the, I have the unique privilege because I'm speaking to roughly the same people every week that often I'm thinking about people who are, end up being in the room. And so typically yeah. it'd be like, okay, I see that person, I know what they're going through and I'm, I'm yeah. writing and speaking with that in mind. Now it's like, I know they're in a, their living room, you know, or in their car. Right. And so now it's going, okay, how do I imagine them? And then, you know, we saw probably, you know, a 20% increase in people watching us online versus our total before. So we know we're connecting with more people. That's and so it's just cool, right? Right? listening to people well, listening to social media, listening to people I'm talking to, kind of, you know, polling the team and going, okay, where, where are people struggling right now? What are the pain points? And how do we make sure that what we're saying the application of what we're teaching is super relevant right there. Um, you know, so that's been, that's been really cool to kind of morph what we were doing. Um, not changing like our approach in terms of what we were going to cover, but like making sure the application points and then the, and then the on ramp into the message is super relevant to where they're living in the middle of this. Totally. So, well, it's interesting because you, you're like a little case study in one of the episodes that, well, it will have already come out by the time this comes out, but that's coming out tomorrow um, of the current week that we are talking right now. Uh, the time warp of recording and then publishing these things is funny. But the episode that's coming out tomorrow is about adjusting our content so that we are speaking to the context of now. That we don't, you don't have to scrap the planned content that you had. Um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to create a whole new set of messages necessarily, but it your your why at the beginning mm -hmm. has to be so acutely relevant to their experience now because Absolutely. if it's not, they're not listening and they don't see why. I mean, have you ever heard me talk about Nick Morgan? Um, who I heard he's a, a speaker coach out in, I, I think Massachusetts. And um, he, I've heard him speak before and he talks about this really awesome idea that, that every person shows up in the room with a hierarchy of needs. Yeah. And, yes. I've heard this guy. Yeah. Okay. So if, if we cannot speak to, if we cannot make what we are talking about more urgent than their most pressing need, they're not, they're not going to take it in at the time, which makes so much sense, but it's such a challenge for us. I just want to say, I think one of the things I'm seeing and I'm hearing from you and I'm hearing from other speakers is this, what is happening in this is it's, it's forcing us to get really clear about the urgency and the need for what it is that we're talking about. And so I think it's just refining people's purpose in a really powerful way that I think is good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and again, I, I just have told my people again and again, like you see obstacle right now, but there is opportunity um, in the middle of it, you know? And so yeah. people still have the same needs that we've been speaking to, um, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to understand how those needs fit in their overall reality that they're trying to make sense of. Yeah. Um, and you need to make sure that you're not speaking of somebody who is perceived as like above what's happening right now and immune to it. And yeah. you need to speak in a way that you're being as authentic as possible in it. And so this, this past weekend, you know, I talked, um, I was talking through just the emotional kind of unrest of right now and talking yeah. about the need for, 
um, health and wholeness. And, and I've mm. talked about the fact that my counselor and I had met and I was not navigating this well. And, mm. um, and I knew it wasn't, but I didn't know, um, I didn't know what to do, you know? Yeah. Um, and so he, you know, he and I had come up with an idea that I would do like a 24 hour phone break, like a fast. Mm. My phone. And so I said, break from my phone. And I thought that I had a phone problem, but mm. I didn't. It was deeper. It wasn't that I had a phone problem. It was that, that my phone problem was kind of covering over the fact that I felt very out of control yeah. and I felt very insecure right now. And yeah. I was on my phone all the time because staying on my phone helped me feel more in control, helped me feel yeah. more secure. And mm-hmm. so I just shared transparently and said, it was, you know, you would go, Scott, you couldn't give up your phone for 24 hours. And I'm like, yeah, it was really hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so just sharing transparently about that kind of gave it like, hey, there, Scott's navigating through this. He's struggling with this emotionally. He had to talk to his counselor about this. And then I was able then to speak to, here's some places I think I see people struggling and here's some ways we can go forward. And I, I just think like leaning into that authentic- authenticity, um, sharing your own struggle in the midst of all this, whatever your topic is, um, yeah. kind of humanizes you and it makes sure that you don't step above people as the person who has all the answers and you go like expert yeah. mode you, you got to be really human in this moment and stay yeah. in a better place. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a funny thing uh, as, as people who, if we're out front, we are leading, right? And so you want to lead with some sense of wisdom and like experience and yes, here, here's what I've learned. Here's the, the best path. And yet we are going through this at the same time. So it's not like one of those, those experiences that is a scar for us that we're like, here's what I did mm-hmm. when that happened. No, this is new for every human <laughs> on the earth right now. <laughs> We've never been through this before. And so um, I think navigating that is really important to, to show up with compassion for ourselves and, and to be so empathetic to our audience. Like, I think that's where it has to start is this really strong sense of I'm feeling with you. And here's my feeling. <laughs> well, and if we're going to be in this online space, I think that the benefit, again, the opportunity is it is so easy to listen to your audience before you speak right now. Mm. Just Go through your Twitter feed, go through your Instagram feed, go through your Facebook feed, see if people are posting, see what the pain points are, see where the emotion is. And then when you begin to speak online to the camera, make sure that you are speaking with that in mind. Um, Because it's not always going to be, and it depends on where you're presenting, you know, some some opportunities are there for you to interact and and do Q&A or, you know, be interactive, but if you're presenting kind of a, a, a kind of packaged talk, you're not in the moment going to be able to listen. It's really going to be about you speaking, and so it's going to be incumbent upon you to have listened really well as you put together that content and prepared yourself so that you're postured where even though you're speaking, people feel like they're being heard yeah. by what you're doing, and so that that okay. is going to be the connection point that this person has listened to me well. Before I eat, before they started talking, and even in the listening, they're speaking to the elephant in the room. They're speaking to that pain point that I have. Oh my gosh, I just was talking to my wife about that. Oh my gosh, I was just talking to my team about that. And and by speaking to those things, you're you're opening up uh, that sense of connection and that credibility there. So I love your giggly kids. Yeah, they're uh, they're we're really big fans of Star Wars in the house, so we just yeah. kind of cycle through all the movies over and over again. So yeah. they've been, they've been champs, you know, I know I, my, uh, my kids too. I'm like, this is, this is hard for them too. And they're being Absolutely. troopers. Their resilience is truly inspiring for me because they're just, we're just all making it work. We're trying to give each other a lot of grace and we need a lot every day. So, yeah. Woo! Oh my gosh. Totally. Um, what you just said, Scott, I feel like is one of those like mind blowing aha things that we sort of know, but that this situation is crystallizing and how, what, a, what a great strategy and insight for everybody listening right now, which is to not just do your homework <laughs> about your audience, but you're listening 
so that what you have to offer resonates and is what people need right now. So I just think that's, that's huge. That's great. Um, so we initially, when I was like, let's do this again, Scott, because we've connected a lot and you're awesome. And we got to actually hang out in Nashville at the story gathering and you've been on my show and I'm just like all the Scott Savage fan that, that you can be. It's a mutual and, feeling for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I did my little launch, when we launched Be Moved and I brought you on screen like this, it was just like the highlight of my week oh. because you talked about big shifts that you had made in your speaking. And that is what Be Moved is about. I mean, that's part of the reason why I changed the name of my company is because I, I feel like in order for us to move our audiences, we as the speakers have to be moved from one place to another place. Like they mirror each other. Otherwise, the big things aren't really happening. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was why we initially wanted to talk, but I, I could not just jump right into that. We've just got to set context yeah. for now. And, and you've got some really important insight around how to bring your voice out into the world in this virtual context we're living in right now. But let's set that aside for a minute because I do want to hear about this transition that that you've made after speaking for 15 years. Something shifted for you. So can you talk about that a little bit what that what that transformation was for you and what it what it felt yeah. like? I started feeling restless. Um, you know, I, I felt restless like I was. Um, I, it, it, it just started as a restlessness at first. Like I just I felt unsettled, you know, and I wasn't sure, okay, so do I need to, you know, do I need to go back to the drawing board and change how I approach writing a talk? Do I need mm -hmm. to change the length of time I speak? Do I need to change? I, I kind of put everything on the table. And, mm -hmm. and, Around that same time, you know, we connected when you first were starting, you know, your coaching and you really mm -hmm. challenged me that I was, I was hiding. And that was, that was strong language for me, but that's why you're a great coach is that you don't pull punches. And you're like, you know, I, I feel like you're really attached to your iPad and you're really attached to this kind of bar table kind of thing. And so the first step was kind of getting a different table. So there was less of a gap between me and my people. And then, and then it was okay getting getting out of my notes, um, and so that took some time. Um, but then, around the same time, I had somebody else that I, I follow who talked about how do you go from preaching with notes to without notes. Mm. And I know for some people that kind of give a, a keynote again and again and again, there is some such repetition that you get more comfortable. But in my world, I'm delivering 40, 40 minute keynotes a year. And so, and so sometimes I'm not finishing writing until Thursday or Friday and I've got 48 hours to then get up and give it. And so I was like, how do I, how do I have that master enough to be, you know, giving that, you know, for notes. And so, um, without notes. And so, but what he, what the guy gave me insight about is he said, Hey, um, it's less about memorizing your talk and it's more about understanding it. Mm -hmm. And so that was so key for me because I was trying to get every precise point correct as opposed to understanding the journey I wanted to bring people on. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, your coaching to kind of change my approach just in terms of how we staged it and then his approach to say, Hey, make sure you understand it. Um, and then, you know, me beginning to kind of experiment and noticing the immediate sense of connection I had more. Yeah. I, I, moved, I moved the barrier, the table to the side, got a smaller table, and all of a sudden I felt more connected, and I was getting more feedback. Yeah. And then I gave it a shot one day, and I said, "Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave my iPad over there, and I'm not gonna open it. I'm gonna leave the cover on." Yeah. And so if I get stuck, I will go over and get it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did like three weeks with no notes, and mm -hmm. you know, a little bit longer, and sometimes, sometimes I would say things that weren't as polished, but I just saw like. A, two or three X level of connection difference mm. by, by leaving the iPad side. And I think what people began to tell me, and I would have never thought about this, 
but they said, when you're not reading off your iPad, I believe you. more. <laughs> totally. I'm like, but these are my words. Like, I mean, I'm reading the words I wrote on the iPad. I go, but when you're looking at me and you're speaking it to me and you're not looking off your notes, you are so much more believable. Yeah. And I connect with you so much more. And I was like, okay. So then like the fourth week, I totally flubbed. I lost my place. I got confused. And so I just said, guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to get my iPad out, figure out what, you know, where I am. I got some laughs. People just ran with me. And then once I kind of failed, you know, quote unquote, and had in that yeah. moment, I realized, yeah. okay, I can live through that. I just kept going. And, um, and so now it's been probably 12, 18 months of speaking without notes and the level, the level of engagement, the level of confidence I have and my willingness to step out and say things that I knew I needed to say, but I was like, oh, it's not my notes, you know, or I needed to say, but I was scared of mm -hmm. or stories or I just feel like I am so much more fearless <laughs> in my speaking. Yeah. And you would, you would think, you would think speaking without notes would be fear inducing. And it was initially a hundred percent. I mean, it was terrifying. Yeah. yeah. But once I got over that hump, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to show up and I'm, I've, I've got, you know, I may have 75 slides that are on my cue screen in the back and I have my remote. I'm going to keep going through it, but I am just going to get up and I'm going to be fully authentic. I'm going to say what I need to say. And if in the moment that comes to me, I'm just going to follow it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of, I wouldn't say it's been a, a Copernican revolution in terms of my speaking, but it's been, <laughs> if I, I went back and I watched some videos a couple months ago from when I first, I've been where I'm about four years. And so they're about four year old. And I was like, it's almost like a different person speaking um, from, from then to now. I mean, it is just radically different. Yeah. No, I, I, that process and that transformation, you said a few words there that I think capture it. Um, it, it starts with a willingness and cause it's a risk. Um, and I, I love that you baby stepped into it in some way. You just were like, my iPad's right over there. And if I need it, and there are moments that you did and you go back and you, you can check in with that. People understand that. I mean, they, they understand what you're doing up there. Mm -hmm. like, uh, one time I just remember giving a client permission. Like if you lose your spot, you can always just say, give me just a second. I'm going to check my notes. Like, no, they would rather you do that yeah, right. and fumble and sort of search for it and panic and, you know, the blood rushes to your head and everybody's uncomfortable. Then handling it, if you can handle it, you can move through those moments. But the, the, the fearless willingness to potentially fall on your face and do it anyway, there's something about that that makes our message not just more believable but the process of our willingness to stand up and say that on our own two feet makes it live in us differently absolutely i don't know the hiding the hiding thing is it's not just um that it gets in the way of audience connection but there's something internal too would you agree and that's where, yeah I, I think that and I, and I think that for me hiding was my ipad and my table mm -hmm. but hiding may look different for you as a speaker you know in a unique way and i think we are all tempted to hide in the yep. art and the work that we do and to to pursue a safer more comfortable path and sometimes sometimes the longer you've been doing it um, you would think the more fearless you would be, but you actually might be just really well experienced at doing the comfortable, safe hiding thing. Yeah. And and I think sometimes the longer you've been doing it, the the more tempting it is to hide because you're so totally. experienced. And totally. so you have to keep climbing the ladder and keep figuring, okay, so what is hiding now? Mm -hmm. Maybe and maybe if you've been speaking for a long time, I've been doing 15 years, maybe 10 years ago hiding was 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 X. But now, 10 years later, hiding is why and continue to say, OK, if I'm going to show up and be my full, authentic, fearless self in a way that shows up and engages my audience, but for myself 
is the next progression and what is hiding. Um, and, uh, and so that's where for me, I, I think I'm, a, you know, I kind of have a sense of what my next thing is going to be, um, in terms of hiding, but this was, was certainly the mountain I had to climb yeah. here to get to the place where I could be note free and just trust myself and engage. And, um, you know, and it's been, you know, if, if you're somebody who wrestles with these things, you know, your iPad, you know, a table, your notes, you know, I just would encourage you, you know, figure out how to make 1% progress every time you speak. Yeah. If you need to, if you need to piecemeal it down, piecemeal it down. But you know, what's on the other side of it is definitely worth the work. Yeah. And I, so a few things, cause I think, um, when you're talking about self-trust, that is absolutely what we're trying to move towards is uh, a willingness to risk because you know, you can, you can handle whatever happens. Um, most of us have a little more time to practice moving to self-trust, but you're literally practicing in your performances, <laughs> like, because that's, that's your time to get up on your feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of how much, um, pastors speak. I just think it's amazing. Um, so that is the first thing. The second thing is I thought you'd appreciate this. I, my fourth grader, my daughter, uh, who's in fourth grade, they invited parents to come in and do these little mini courses. And so I had done one when my oldest was in fourth grade, I did a mini course on public speaking and it was fine, but everybody took it really seriously and it just wasn't any fun. And I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta change this up a little bit. So this time I did sort of improv and performance and I kept it really loose. And, uh, it's interesting when you have the challenge of trying to teach young people these core concepts. Mm -hmm. What does a fourth grader need to understand about the risk of stepping out front and performing? And so one of the, the key things I talked about was a sense of freedom. Mm. That was the best word I could come up with was freedom. I want you to feel free in the moment. I want you to, it was like, I, I want to move past risk and risk taking because it's just like, how does a fourth grader understand risk, but freedom and like full expression and fun and joy and just the sense of fullness. They totally got that. And that's the one that they all talk about and remember, like when I see them around at school, not anymore, but when, when I would see them around the community, they'd be like, I'm practicing being free. <laughs> I'm like, well, Yay! I think what you hit on is that some of these battles that we face as speakers, they're two things. They're, they're universally human. Yeah. And they started much earlier than we remember. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of us that don't remember what it was like to be nine. Yeah. But I think some of the feelings that we feel now at 19, 29, 39, 49 yeah. as public speakers those are experiences we started feeling in a very different sandbox, mm -hmm. but as a nine-year-old. And yeah. so recognizing that these are just lifelong things that we're going to be working through. And it may be the same issue we wrestled with at nine, but we're, we're going around at a different level. Yeah. But some of these are going to be the things that, that, are, that are just always with us. We're always going to be struggling with these. And sometimes di different size stages or different mediums are going to bring them out in different ways, but just paying attention and giving yourself grace to this is just part of the human experience. Yeah. And doing something in public, like speaking makes it just more intense. Um, and uh, I think it's a gift though, because I get to, I get to work on this in a way that maybe somebody else doesn't. And so it means yeah. I get to be, you know, more and more of who I was made to be. So I, I totally agree with you. I think it's a really fabulous playground of self-development and, uh, and so rewarding, I think. I find it. I, I like helping other people in their journeys too. But I, you know, I gotta, I gotta walk the walk the talk too. Mm -hmm. Okay, Scott. So let's do our this moved me moments. I haven't done this with you in in a while. So uh, I'm throwing this at you. I didn't ask you to prep one, yep. but knowing you, I'm sure that. Um, you are you are attuned to something that has moved you recently. So th throw it at me. What has moved you? Oh, um, so I would say two things recently. Um, one, and I'm not sure 
if you shared this, but it was mm -hmm. a video. I think I first saw it on Cheryl Sandberg's page. Yeah. And uh, she's, she was with, since she was with Facebook or was with Facebook. Yeah. And it was the two doctors like playing piano and singing songs together. Mm. Uh, and they serve in emergency medicine. Aww. And they were, I think they were singing uh, Imagine by John Lennon. Yes. But they had like a number, they had like a number of songs they had sung recently. And just the, the, the awareness that we need some sort of outlet to unpack the emotions that are laden within the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that all of us in this season are trying to make sense of how do I do my craft? How do I do my work in a rapidly changing context? And yeah. that in and of itself is, is more than a full-time job. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, how do I do that in a way while I'm also caring for myself? Yeah. Because I don't just do the work as a robot. I do it as a human. And so I have to take care of myself so that I can keep doing that work. And that simple 58 second clip of Imagine for me was a reminder that those people who probably pulled a 12 hour shift in a hospital trying to make sense of PPEs and COVID and masks and supplies and mm -hmm. ventilators, they're finding a way to care for themselves and unpack that emotion. I thought mm -hmm. it was just an inspiring thing that you know, reminded me that I need to find my own outlets to be able yeah. to keep doing this work well. Totally. Staying grounded, staying compassionate and, and staying in touch with this. Um, you know, the, the, I, I feel like the creative arts right now, and I'm using that term really, really broadly is, is like spirit and soul food right now in a really, really important way. Uh, because it's so easy to, to, feel disconnected from all of that. So love, love. Thank you. That's awesome. Can I, can I share one other thing? Yeah. I, I think I would also say, and I've seen this. Uh, so I work with a guy named Michael Hyatt. He's a business coach and leadership coach. And um, he's kind of pivoted his content in the season. And uh, he, he led a book publishing company through the recession. And so he's talking about the things he learned through that. Yeah. And just watching the people in our cohort, how hungry they are mm. for what he's sharing. I would just, I, what, what inspires me is people who are feeding people right now, because yeah. I think we often think that, okay, do they care what I'm saying? Do they care what I'm teaching? Do they care about what I'm doing? And right now, can they even afford to pay me for it right now? Cause nobody's making money, but people are hungry for hope. People yeah. are hungry for help. And the people that I see, who are pushing through all of the kind of internal battles to mm -hmm. get up and speak in this setting, you know, talking to a camera, uh, hopefully keeping their message going. I would just encourage you. What inspires mm -hmm. me is that you're recognizing that people are hungry and yeah. they're looking for you to feed them. And when you go out there and you stand up and you do what you do, even if you've never done a zoom before, even if you've never mm -hmm. had a camera before, even if mm -hmm. you've never, done any of this before and you're willing to get up and and show up and do the work and try to help people you yeah. know even in your stumbles that's inspiring uh because yeah. people are so 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 hungry right now yeah uh, for some some hope yep i think this is a, an incredibly potent time and needed time for people to step up and use their voice in a way that serves their audience. Um, and, and if we can do all these things that you're talking about, Scott, of like really listen to where people are at and let that drive what it is that we are sharing and doing and offering that is, um, I, I just feel like that's soul work. Like we just said, so cool. Yeah. I've been following Michael's stuff, but honestly, until the last few weeks I have, I'm back engaged with him in a way that I haven't been in a long time, partly because I'm like needed, needed, needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Huge. Okay. My, this moved me moment yeah, tell came me. In the mail today and I was like, Oh my gosh, it's perfect. Cause I'm talking to Scott today. I got this from Brad Montague. Brad. 
Yep. So his book, is this backwards for you? I can read it. As a member of the Society for Better Grownups, I do solemnly pinky promise to grow and help others grow, laugh and help others laugh, and especially fly and help others fly. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So it's part of his launch campaign. He just launched his book, Be a Better Grown Up. Right. And here we are, all these parents uh, home with their kids all the time. And it is really our chance to help shape our kids' lives in a really profound way. And not just our kids, but all kids, like the community kids, the country's kids, the world's kids. Like it really is a call for all of us to be better grownups. And and Brad's one of those people that I'm like, gosh, what what is Brad Montague doing with his kids today? What can I do to help make their my kids' days a little bit brighter? Um, I would say I'm like 50-50. 50 50% 50 of the time I'm like, hey, and then the other half of the time I'm like, Pfft. so um it's but it's 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 one of those things I'm like vision, focusing on what I could do move towards um but i think we have a real opportunity to to shape our kids experience in this so that we're going to be talking about this is historical we are creating history as we are living it and so what is the story that our kids are going to be telling about this time you know it's going to be i got to watch star wars movies all the time <laughs> They did do a lot of homework this morning, so this is a reward. They've worked. Yeah. They've worked. Really oh, hard. totally. I mean, and hey, if you told me they were watching Star Wars movies all day, I'd be like, I get it. I get it. You got to do what you got to do. I just love. That I love a beautiful story for them. You know. Yeah. So I don't. I don't I, really have the answers. I just want to be a better grown up. Well, and that's where again, like I just go, like you know, Brad had no idea that his oh, book was going to launch yeah. in the middle of this. Right. And I'm sure, because Brad's human like us, he's sweating it. Oh my gosh, am I going to sell any books? Amazon's not shipping books right now. Yeah. Like, do people want, you know, light, wonder-filled, you know, like, is this right. going to, like, Brad, who Brad has been for years mm -hmm. is exactly who we need right now. Totally. We need the truth wrapped in a package that is filled with imagination and wonder and love and hope. And yeah. so it's like, what, what better time for Brad to be a voice and for be introducing a, a book like this? Um, Cause none of us know what we're doing. We're just making up as we go. We truly are. We truly are. I agree. This is so great. Scott, I know you have to run. Um, but I just want to say thank you once again for your connection and your time and your wisdom. I feel like there's like good, some good wisdom bombs in this one. This is really good. Well, I, I love what you do, Sally. You are, I can't tell my speaking journey without Sally. And so, I'm so I'm so grateful for the investment you've made in me and the thousands of people that I get to touch when I step on a stage. Mm. And so um, I'm grateful for, this new season with Be Moved. And uh, I'm excited for how I'll continue to be a better voice and speaker and human because you're in my life. So thanks for uh, the work. That means the world to me, really, truly. Thank you, Scott. Um, all right, we will talk soon.